everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to be here today. Um, I'm a really lucky person, and by that I don't mean I've won the lottery several times over, but I get to combine three of my absolute passions in life, and I get paid for it. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> I've got an absolute passion for enhancing sport performance, so being able to help athletes get better. I have a passion for technology, so long as it makes my life better. There's some out there that doesn't. And I have a thirst for historical knowledge, because in this day and age of fast news cycles, dare I say it, fake news cycles, uh, I think it's nice sometimes to take a step back and have a look at when there were key moments in history where change was possible in different fields. Uh, and the field that I'm going to talk to you about today is athlete tracking. Before we do that, have a look around. I don't know about you, I don't know if you felt it when you walked in here, but every time I come here and have the pleasure of coming here from work, my heart skips a beat. It's a pretty exciting place to be. There's been a number of special things that have happened on that stadium over the years, so it's a privilege to be here. So we'll talk about athlete tracking, but first let's go back, and go back quite a way and look at where this tracking thing actually started. Um, so there's key things in history where change is possible. Unfortunately, that can be physical wars or even cold wars. So for tracking technology, the Second World War was when the, the US military really amped up its uh, struggles to be able to get speed of information and precision of information. And they're key things that are still with us today, speed and precision of location information. Uh, it wasn't just a physical war, as I mentioned, the Cold War uh, and America entering the space race against Russia was another key moment in history. Russia won the opening salvo of that, if you like, by launching Sputnik, the first satellite into space. Uh, and some American physicists quickly realised that they could track the location of Sputnik from satellite signals coming back down to Earth. And at that moment, I guess, was the genesis of GPS technology. So if you can track where a satellite is on, uh, from Earth with satellite signals, you can probably track where you are on Earth from satellite signals. So GPS was born. The US military continued to develop that concept over many years, but it wasn't available to the public. In 1983, the kind of ironically named Korean Airlines Flight 007 uh, was shot down. All passengers and crew died when it veered into Russian airspace. So not having precise location information put those people at risk and, and ultimately cost them their lives. So President Reagan, uh, after that event, uh, actually allowed the US military precision of, of GPS to be available to the public. And I think that was a moment in, in time that entrepreneurs around the world got really excited and really, really busy. It's only a few short years later that you could buy a vehicle with GPS navigation in it. It's probably hard to even understand a world without navigation, depending on the age. Uh, and it's nice that I'm slightly younger than VU's position as a, a university and age as a university, slightly. But can you imagine? Most of you have GPS navigation in your phones. Some of you will have a smart watch connected to your phone. Some of you will have that in your cars. And there's multiple uses of this tracking technology outside of sport. And I will get to the sport application soon. So we can track endangered animals. We can do that so we can understand their habitats a little bit better and protect these animals. I can track my children if I choose to. I can get a little tag and attach it to their school bags and know where they, or at least their bags, are at any given time. If you have elderly relatives or people suffering from Alzheimer's, you can track them as well. Um, the re very recent FIFA World Cup just completed. Uh, pretty exciting series and an exciting final there. For the very first time in that sport, there was tracking data which was made live and made available live to coaches and managers on the side of the pitch. But there's nothing really new about tracking technology in sport. But I guess um, some of the key things are, well, hang on, sport, really? It's just a hobby, right? It's not that important in the grand scheme of things. Your businesses are much more important than sport, surely. Sport's just a fun thing that we do on weekends. Well, it's kind of big business as well, and it's a business that we're very interested in. The combined worth of the French team in the final at the World Cup was somewhere over $2 billion of salary costs. That's some serious dough. Um, Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo has just changed teams, uh, signed on for some astronomical figure, 170 million Australian dollars or something like that, a little bit more than what I get paid to do my passions. But in the first day that he's at his new club, Juventus, $60 million worth of sales with a jersey with his number on it in one day. So sport, not so small, 
as a business uh, overall and globally. So let's, let's sort of dig a little bit into the sport example. So athlete tracking in sport's not new. It's been around since well before I was born, but it used to be done manually. So you'd have someone watching maybe one player in a game and recording with pen and paper when and where they moved on the field and trying to work out if they were jogging or running or sprinting or whatever. But you don't get much value out of that because perhaps two or three hours after a game, you would have information on one player, perhaps two or three hours after, could be longer. You don't have any context on that player to their teammates, you don't have the context of that player and their teammates to the opposition or to the ball or to key phases of the game. So better options were needed. So here in Melbourne, uh, there's, there's a company that's really led the advancement of GPS in sport. So this company, Catapult Sport, was part of a cooperative research centre of which the Australian Institute of Sport and CSIRO were key partners in. Catapult was a spin-off from that company and, and we at VU worked extensively for years with Catapult uh, in independently evaluating uh, and then therefore helping them with development of their technology. They're now a publicly listed company, they're worth about $500 million, so a nice little startup success from here in Melbourne in the technology field. So GPS, origins in tracking warships, now used ubiquitously in sport, as Brett mentioned at the beginning, which is great, except for if you play your games indoors, because GPS relies on communication with satellites to work. So there's other solutions out there. There's local positioning systems where instead of a tag on a player, and, and you'll see an example of, of what they look like communicating uh, with satellites, instead of that happening, it communicates with base stations around a stadium. So you can get the location of players on the field of play. There's also optical systems which use computer vision technology to turn uh, video of where a player is on the field of play into XY location information. And if you've got the location, theoretically, you should be able to then work out how far players are running. So lots and lots of uses for technology and tracking in sport. But I'll just go back a step. I did mention I was passionate about technology. The US pet wearables industry is suggested to be worth more than $2 billion annually soon. And you know, whilst originally surprising to me, I probably shouldn't be that surprised. This is my dog. This is my two-year-old Labradoodle chasing a ball at our local park. And I can tell you that my two-year-old Labradoodle can hit 43 kilometres per hour and pull almost 1G cornering to chase her ball. I did say I was passionate about this stuff, uh, so I have lots of guinea pigs in the house to do. So we have all these different technologies. So I want you to picture for now that you're in a sporting club. So you're working in a professional sporting club and you've been tasked with selecting athlete tracking technology. You're going to have a bunch of questions. Hopefully, you're going to have a bunch of questions. Some of those might be, uh, can I use these, this, this same system in training and in games? Can I use this same system to capture all of the things that we do in training and in games? Uh, how much is it going to cost? That might well be your first question. But hopefully some of you in the audience are actually thinking about speed and precision. How quickly am I going to get information from this system and how precise is it? So there's been an awful lot of work done validating um, athlete tracking systems, all the different types, the local positioning, the global positioning and the optical systems. And Victoria University, we, we've done a lot of work in that field ourselves. But until recently, no one had compared these systems under the same conditions in a stadium environment during actual games. So we were making assumptions that what we saw in the lab carried through to real conditions. Okay? And that's a very interesting assumption to make and perhaps one that we shouldn't have. So FIFA have commissioned some research. They put out a, a request for proposals uh, to undertake research on validating athlete tracking systems. It was a couple of years ago now. Uh, and we were one of about 20 odd universities around the world that received that request for proposal. And that was on the back of our years of work, especially in the AFL with global positioning systems and, and working with companies like Catapult. We, we pitched uh, for the brief. I got to fly to Zurich, which is cool. You know, you don't always spend time in your office or at the MCG. The bad part was it was one night in Zurich. That's not fun. That's not cool. Uh, but we did get the gig. So ahead of all other universities in the world, we're the only ones who actually met their brief because we had this multidisciplinary team that could put together a package that would answer what was nearly an impossible brief. 
And we thought of all sorts of crazy ideas on how we would attack it from drones holding cameras above the playing field to doing the rock star thing like the microphone today, or building a big gantry over the, the soccer pitch and being able to capture information. We didn't go with any of those solutions. We came up with our own uh, computer vision solution, uh, one that we were able to get access to, and it's jointly developed by the Australian Institute of Sport and Disney Corporation, which I love telling my kids about. Yep, Mickey Mouse was involved in our science, <laughs> which is probably not a great link sometimes. So we were able to validate 14 of these athlete tracking systems from around the world. These are systems that are used in the biggest competitions in the world currently, and a lot of assumptions made on how accurate they are. So what did we find? Well, if you have a look at this, I won't run you through too much detail here. Each column is a different parameter that we would hope that these tracking systems could actually handle. Um, the type of system is shown in the left-hand column, and really simple system, because we're used to dealing with sport and, and engaging with varied stakeholders in sport. Green is good, orange is OK, red is terrible. There's an awful lot of red up there for most of these systems. So that there's some work to be done in this space. Now, we're not saying that's the true representation of how accurate all of these systems are. This was under the conditions that we tested them on on that day, but there's a fair bit of work still to be done. So I've talked about a passion for enhancing athletic performance, technology, et cetera. But I stand here today probably more excited than I have ever been about the use of athlete tracking technology in sport. Because what I want to be able to do now is I want to be able to find bad performance and not just bad performance, but deliberately bad performance. It's estimated that match fixing, or the process of illegally changing the outcome of a sporting event, enables about $140 billion to be laundered across the world annually. So we're talking big corporate crime business going on. It's possible, it's possible that with athlete tracking information, we can detect when a player has played differently during a match, because that's what happens one or two players are asked to do something slightly different in matches to affect the outcome of the game. Apparently, it's really easy to know when a match has been fixed. You see differences in betting markets, maybe an, uh, a strange transfer of funds to a particular individual, all of those things. It's really, really, really difficult to prove it. So we, we have some matches where we fixed those matches, and it did coincide with the work that we did for FIFA in validating the athlete tracking systems. So as part of that, we actually fixed these matches. We asked athletes to play slightly differently. We're now going to interrogate the athlete tracking data to determine whether we can detect when these players play differently in games. But we need a little bit of help. Okay, we have the sports side well and truly covered. Some of you are going to be using systems in your workplace, if you're in the finance or the banking industry, for example, where you look for unusual transactions occurring. You're going to have some technology there. We need some assistance with some, some serious computing grunt. We need some assistance with some, some deep learning and artificial intelligence that can ultimately um, build a system that's able to automatically detect um, these strange occurrences in matches from players. So I would welcome the opportunity to, to chat to you. I'd welcome the opportunity to chat to you if you're interested in tracking in your business and how it can help you, and we can certainly help. And equally, uh, if you have your own ideas on how we can more effectively and quickly track athletes with speed and precision. But ultimately, I'm hoping that we can regain the trust of the sporting public and we can protect and preserve the integrity of the sports that we love using technology. Thank you.